Welcome to Healthcare Triage Live. I'm going to assume we are actually live. Um, we'll start out with a few brief bits of housekeeping. Um, please check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash healthcare triage, which we love. Um, so many good things there. Some of the posts you guys are sharing really well there. It's becoming a good community and also a good place to share lots of the videos. So that's awesome. Check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. You guys keep more and more keep joining. I can't tell you how much that means to us. Plus, it's letting us do some cool new stuff. We've got some new ideas going out, some projects we hope to announce in the next few months, um, and some other things going on. And any kind of support that you give us allows us to make the show bigger and better. Um, also, make sure you check out the other episodes. Of course, there's you know Monday's normal episode, Friday's news episodes. We really appreciate everyone watching. And finally, uh, there's an ongoing, growing uh, Reddit community that I can never remember the uh, link for. It'll be down below. You can check it out. Post your comments and your questions for today in today's video. Um, we will see them there. They'll keep uploading it onto my screen. Don't go to next week's. Don't go to last week's. You can tweet them as well. We're not as good at monitoring that. We have lots of questions. Let's get started. Paper Party asks, are all infant formulas the same? Are the more expensive brands better or more nutritious than the store brands? Very, very rarely in life are things that are like more expensive, more nutritious. It's just pretty much a fact of life. But not all formulas are the same. Um, they are very different. Some of them are like, you know, they've broken down the nutrients. Some of them are not going to have uh, milk. Some are soy based. So those are very different. And sometimes for relatively rare but real reasons, infants will be asked by their doctors to be put on other formulas. More often, parents keep switching formulas around because they think that they're getting some kind of benefit in terms of the baby's happiness or gas or stool pattern and almost all of that turns out to be either placebo or secular trends just things change as baby's age so for the vast vast majority of infants the plain old regular formula is perfect um, and more than enough for your baby i mean they're all designed to have what your baby needs none of them probably are as good as breast milk which is always sort of what's recommended as best but certainly all of them would be fine um, and more than adequate. So I wouldn't be worried about you know spending more money because you think your baby's going to get better nutrition. Um, almost all infants that you see as adults today were raised on regular old formula and thin, too thin ain't a problem for most people. So they're going to get plenty of nutrition. Jacob Hoare says, what do you think on caloric restriction diets in humans? A paper was just released on a low protein, high carbohydrate diet in the same benefits with less side effects. Are mice a good analog for humans? So two things there. First, what do I think about all these diets? Go, you know, I rec really do recommend go watching the episode that we did on nutrition recommendations. There's no good diet that's the thing I'd recommend for everyone. People are individuals. Everybody sort of gets along in different ways. Um, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the high carbohydrate diets aren't necessarily the best way to go for a lot of people because it doesn't seem to be doing well globally as we shifted in that direction uh, as we went to like low fat, higher carbohydrate. Obesity epidemic, type 2 diabetes, everything in the world seemed to get worse. Um, is it causal for every single person? I don't know. Um, but I don't push low carb, low protein, high carbohydrate diets the most. Um, I do, however, think that you sort of need to find whatever works best for you and try to stick with that. I've seen people do that with paleo diets. I've seen people do that with Weight Watchers diets. I've seen people do that with Atkins diets. I've seen people do that with what you're describing, low protein, hard carbohydrate diets. But they all seem to be a reasonable number of calories and they all seem to be watching it. Your second question, are mice a good analog for humans? Sometimes, but rarely. Um, you know, go watch the artificial sweetener episode if you want if you want a good example of that. Because you feed you feed rats or mice basically high doses of all kinds of stuff, and they all get bladder cancer. And that's why, like artificial sweeteners, everybody you know freaked out. But then, of course, when you study in humans, none of that was seen. Now, when we talk about especially diets in humans, so much of that is behavioral. You know, the idea that we can take what we see in mice and replicate that in people, like why mice get obese and why humans get obese, is so much more complicated. So I don't like to get my diet and nutrition recommendations from the mice. It just doesn't bear out in reality. Uh, and I think a lot of the studies that you've seen popularized in the media recently, the ideas of like, if you do all your eating in 12 hour periods, that's all mice studies. Um, I don't think those translate terribly well to humans. Victor the Vulcan, 
Does a high protein diet increase the risk of kidney disease or damage by higher protein? I mean for 160 to 180 pound male, 120 to 180 grams of protein. Why eating all that protein? You know, I just, I don't, why? It's just like, you know, if the idea somehow that if you eat crap loads of protein, I almost cursed there, that was impressive. If you eat crap loads of protein that you're suddenly gonna gain muscle mass, that's not how the body works. Um, there's some, I guess, evidence that like, you know, adding more protein or, you know, trying to put more calories and stuff into your body while you're trying to build mass or you're, you know, you're sort of in an animal, whatever, that, that does work a bit. But, you know, you can't sort of target the protein thing. Also, it is true that if you eat tons and tons of protein, you do, you can cause like short-term damage to your kidneys uh, because they're not used to processing all that protein. The long-term effects, I don't know necessarily as much about. Um, and I don't know where that threshold cutoff is. You should talk to your doctor about that, which is a good time to break and say, for all stuff medical, you should be speaking to a physician, your physician, not me. I um, mean, nothing of what I say here uh, is supposed to be taken as uh, medical advice, and you shouldn't do that. So, uh, you know, high pro when people say high protein diets, usually they're talking about like Adkins or Paleo or something like that. Those have not been shown to really hurt the kidneys. What you're talking about is like mega, mega dosing on protein, probably with that powder, because you think it's going to give you muscle mass and bulk. And I'd be like, again, shrugging and be like, why, why are you doing that? Why? Jackie Ulrich, any truth to high dose vitamin C could cause miscarriage in early pregnancy? All right, so I don't know of really any good evidence that that actually does occur. Um, if I think if it really did occur and there was good evidence for it, we would see warnings about it. But let's back up a second and I would again say, why are you doing that? Why are you mega dosing on vitamin C? Uh, it doesn't prevent colds. It doesn't do a lot of the stuff we say it does. Um, there have been good randomized controlled trials of that. It doesn't like you know, do all the antioxidant stuff that people think it does to like sort of, you know, cure whatever it is. All you really do when you mega dose on vitamins is make very expensive urine. Your body pees it out for the most part because your body's just not handled or prepared to handle it. It doesn't do anything with it. And so you excrete it. Um, and so why are you doing that? Secondly, if you're buying them in supplement stores, we, I can't tell you how many episodes we've done where the stuff that, that's in those bottles so rarely is what they say it is by you know all the supplements and stuff are unregulated and so there was that great study it was on healthcare triage news how like in new york they randomly tested all these products in the big stores and in tons of them there were literally not one molecule of what it said on the bottle was actually in the bottle it was like ground up asparagus and house plants so you know are you sure you're getting the vitamin c i don't even know why you're taking the vitamin c but I guess even if it does, I don't think there's a ton of good evidence to worry about it causing miscarriage. Horseo lover. My brother rarely washes his hands after he uses the bathroom. It really grosses me out, but also makes me wonder, do we really need to wash our hands every time? Should I not worry about his habits? Yeah, well, it's grossing me out too. And I don't even know your brother. Um, so yeah, I mean, watch the parasite month. We, we transmit a ton of that stuff fecal oral. Um, tons of viral diseases are transmitted fecal or, fecally orally. Gastroenteritis, norovirus, like tons of these viruses are all fecal oral. It's because like we don't necessarily wash our hands at certain points and then we carry those germs out there. Certainly one for people involved in food preparation, it's really necessary. Now, having said all this, is your brother really gonna die because of this? No, I mean, you know, still it's mostly unlikely that anything's gonna be transmitted, but it's such a low cost thing to do and it, and it works so well. Plus, hand washing in general is such a good idea, not just after the bathroom. It's because, you know, we touch our nose, we touch our face, we cough on our hands by accident, then we touch other things and people. That's how diseases get transmitted, even if it's not fecal oral. Being in the bathroom is a great time to remember to wash your hands periodically. So not even just washing his hands after he goes to the bathroom is a little bit gross because of what he might have just touched in the bathroom, but it's also missing a great opportunity to, to wash your hands in general, which is a very proven and good way to prevent transmission of disease in the human population. So be, be, yeah, tell him he should wash his hands. I, I think he should wash his hands. Uh, Lisa Jones says, if I am aware of the placebo effect, does it still work? Example, if I take a drug thinking it won't cure my headache because it only works as a placebo, will the drug be less effective? Possibly. Not believing in something can probably have as much of effect in something as believing in it. Um, having said that, it won't 100% negate it otherwise. I mean, certainly, 
you know, there have been those studies where, like, they tell people they're giving them pain meds and then they give them the placebo and they think they're getting the effect of the pain med. I would imagine in some way you could also counter some of the effect of an actual pain med if, if it's not real. Having said that, they probably still will get some effect. It would just negate it in, a, in some sort of uh, uh, proportional way. Not fully, probably, but in some way it would. So, you know, try to have a good attitude. You know, it's not going to hurt you, um, and, it, and it will probably help. So, uh, you know, I would say, yes, being aware of it will change things, but not completely negate them. Ikawan, is it safe to eat raw eggs? I've read the contrary to popular brief, the risk of salmonella is actually really low nowadays, but is it low enough that it be safe to eat regularly? So one of the interesting things about like salmonella and eggs is that a lot of the disease that people get are because of the shell. It's not what's in the eggs. It's actually, it's all in the eggs. And then when you prepare it and you're like, you're still using your hands and realize that that's often how the salmonella gets transmitted. So I guess if you're terribly concerned, be really careful or wash the egg shell before you open it. So that wash, getting the salmonella off the shell, if that's possible, I've never even thought about it. I mean, maybe some is embedded in the shell, I don't know. But that's where a lot of it comes from. But you are correct that things are much safer today than they used to be. In fact, one of my favorite summer myths is the idea that people panic that mayonnaise is a real concern because mayonnaise is made from raw eggs uh, and that if you take mayonnaise out uh, that it's a problem and it's actually what the issue is that it's it's store-bought mayonnaise and store-bought mayonnaise is sterile you know pretty much even though it's made with raw eggs because they can sterilize it at that point so uh, it, it's not the main when you buy store-bought mayonnaise and then you put it in chicken salad and you leave it out in the sun people get sick it's the chicken it's not the mayonnaise the mayonnaise is almost always sterile but everybody assumes it's the eggs the eggs today are much cleaner uh, than they used to be. Having said that, why do you want to eat raw eggs? Why? I mean, just that's gross. Uh, it's not as if raw eggs are magical and that you're getting some kind of special magical protein. Is this because of Rocky? Is this is that why? Because it's like you know you drink so raw. You can cook the eggs and you're still going to get protein. You can soft boil them or hard boil them. You're still going to get protein. Um, and so you know, why are you eating raw eggs? It's gross. Eric Thomas, do the potential benefits of coffee consumption apply to instant coffee consumption as well? And yes, we're so happy so many of you have enjoyed the coffee episode. I don't know. Unfortunately, I think most of the, the studies don't check to see how the coffee is made. Having said that, I'd say probably because I don't know what would be taken out of the coffee. I'd also say... It's important to remember that so much of the benefits we see in coffee consumption are still correlative. They're not causal. So don't drink coffee because you think it's going to make you perfectly healthy. Just don't be afraid of coffee. So don't panic that coffee is going to hurt you. There's like no evidence for that. And what, what you know, epidemiologic evidence does exist points in the other direction. But I don't think, I won't think coffee is so strong that I'd recommend people go start doing it and find a way to do it. But now, see, this is gonna be the theme today. Why are you drinking instant coffee? Why? It's not that hard to make good coffee. Co and good coffee tastes much better than instant coffee. There was a run when I was roasting my own beans for years. Um, you could buy them green from this place in California, and then I'd roast them all at home, and the, oh my God, best coffee you've ever had, because you can totally get the roast exactly right. Most of the stuff you get in the stores is so over-roasted, and you've taken out so much of the, the good flavor, but roasting coffee at home smells terrible, and my wife was finally tired of it, and we didn't want to have it anymore, and after the second time I set off the fire alarm and woke up all the kids, I had to stop. Um, so... I don't even know how I got on that tangent. Oh, yes, because why are you drinking instant coffee? Duh, that's just terrible. Why, you know, it's so easy to make good coffee. Make good coffee. Coffee's so good. Why Why ruin it? Data error. Some, claim, some sources claim that sleeping on one's back provides more beneficial sleep, helps with waking up effectively, etc. Is there any good research on the health benefits of different sleeping positions? I've not seen this research, with the exception of with infants. There was a period of time where there's a lot of epidemiologic evidence that showed that putting an infant to sleep on their back, at least before they could roll over, 
seem to be correlated with a significantly reduced risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And SIDS, or sudden infant death syndrome, is the number one killer of babies outside of the neonatal period. So anything we can re do to reduce the risk of SIDS is a huge deal. That's where you hear about the back to sleep campaign. We started putting all babies to sleep on their backs. And the, the risk of, you know, the rate of SIDS has gone down. We're not gonna have a randomized controlled trial, of course, where we randomize babies to put them on one way or the other. It's never gonna happen. This is the best evidence we're gonna have. So for babies, back to sleep. For adults, I don't know, I don't know of any evidence. I don't know of anybody that says it one way or the other, so I don't know why you do it. Whatever works for you, man, plus your role. I fall asleep on my back, I always seem to wake up on my stomach. So I, obviously my body at some point says, get on your stomach, but I like to fall asleep on my back. I suppose if, if you're mashing your nose into a pillow, it could be harder to sleep, but you know, sleep is one of those things where I wouldn't, I wouldn't really you know, stress, do what seems to work best for you. Mitch Hayden, is there any good evidence for massage therapy? Aside from it feeling nice, I'm considering it as a career option, but I'd have a hard time dedicating myself to something that isn't evidence-based. Well, you know, this is the kind of thing, like any good evidence for what? You know, you gotta have, you have to have an outcome you wanna measure. Does it make people feel better? I'm sure the answer is yes. Does it perhaps loosen up muscles? I, I would imagine yes. Does it like, if you have a knot in your back, can you massage it out? I'd imagine yes. Is it going to cure my chronic illness? I'd imagine no. And I think that's where people get into trouble where they start over crediting it. But there's nothing wrong with going into a field that, that provides something that makes people happy. I think that that's like a ton of the entertainment industry and that's perfectly fine. You don't judge every, every career doesn't have to be evidence based and that it's like doing medical good. Lots of people do non-medical careers and a lot of them are just doing things that service industry that people like. So. I probably wouldn't get too stressed about this. Um, I get massages not that regularly. Probably wish I got them more. I think my wife does it more often than me. And it's, who cares if it's evidence-based? It's cash, we're paying for it, and it makes us happy and it works for you. That's awesome. That's economics, that's capitalism. Go, be happy. Connor O'Shea, is, ton that's the truck. is tonsillectomy an effective treatment for occurring tonsillitis? Oh, so controversial. Um, I would say, well, I mean, say, let's be honest. If you take someone's tonsils out, it's less likely they're going to get tonsillitis. Yes, that is that is probably true. The question is like, how necessary is that? Um, probably not as much as it used to be. We used to take all kids' tonsils out. And then Jack Weinberg in Evidence-Based Medicine, and I know I wrote an upshot column on this, and maybe we did an episode on this, I can't remember, um, showed that really whether or not kids got tonsillitis was entirely like doctor dependent and there was no good evidence one way or the other. And the evidence seemed to show that the vast majority of kids didn't need tonsillectomies. And today, almost no kids get tonsillectomies. I imagine there are still some kids who get such bad recurring tonsillitis that eventually they get recommended to have tonsillectomy. I don't know necessarily what the evidence would say one way or the other to, to say definitively what to do. But we, we use tonsillectomy much more rarely than we used to. So it would need to be really bad, I think, before most doctors go to it. But you should talk to your doctor if you're thinking about tonsillectomy. WizKid22193, is there any research on the best way to clean minor cuts and scrapes such as alcohol, peroxide, and betadine? Such a great question. One of my you know favorite things because, of course, I don't even know if we did an episode on this, but this was actually in one of our, uh, definitely in some of the books. So... The best way to treat a minor wound is moist and covered, moist and covered, again and again and again. All this idea that you gotta air out or dry out a wound is crap. When you air it out, dry it out, that takes longer to heal. Skin heals by the cells growing in from the sides, and they can only, cells can only move and grow in a moist, wet environment. So if you dry everything out, you get a scab, and that's bad and everything else. So you don't wanna do that. Having said that, um, Peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, is like the worst thing you could use on a cut. It's a myth, it's a huge myth. And everybody loves hydrogen peroxide because you can see it bubbling in the wound. You know what that bubbling is? That's the hydrogen peroxide killing you. Um, that's it killing healthy cells. Because hydrogen peroxide kills everything in contact. Sure, it kills the germs. It also kills your healthy cells. Um, don't do it. Don't ever do it. We should never be using hydrogen peroxide to clean out a wound. In fact, randomized controlled trials show that wounds treated with hydrogen peroxide take longer to heal and have worse outcomes than wounds treated with nothing or with placebo. Hydrogen peroxide once killed a woman. There's a great 
Kate's literature time where, where like a woman had I think some kind of breast surgery and the huge hydrogen peroxide on it it got into the wound an air bottle bubble got into a blood vessel because of the hydrogen peroxide went to her heart killed her don't do it don't do it hydrogen peroxide having said that betadine like kills everything too so probably not the best bet same without what do you want soap and water Neosporin works really well too because that also is like a barrier protection and also has the antibiotic component. So some things like antibiotic ointment, um, barrier protection, washing it with soap, keeping it moist and covered, that's your best bet. And what I just said is randomized controlled trials. They did trials, first of all, with pigs who evidently have skin very much like humans. And secondly, human randomized controlled trials. They cut people. I don't know who would volunteer for such a thing, but they do. They treat the wounds in different ways. They check and see what happens, what works best. What I just told you is what works best. Here we go. Fake idolatry. Any research on Teflon pans and their safety or their hazards when they are scratched? This is one of those where I go, like, this stuff's so ubiquitous. If this was a real problem, I think we'd be noticing it in society. Instead, like, everybody is healthier than they've ever been, and the life expectancy of the human race just keeps increasing dramatically, and we're all doing great, so I don't know why we worry about such things. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. But but having said that, I don't know of any good evidence. I have Teflon pans at home. I don't know. Nonstick pans are great. I don't know of any. I don't know of any good evidence and why people are so concerned about this stuff. I, if if I'm wrong and somebody shows me the good evidence, I'll say so. But but this stuff would have been recalled. I mean, we'd know about it. It'd be on the front page of every paper if this was causing major health problems. So um, I probably wouldn't stress. Tyler Kennedy, I eat a lot of peanut butter, about two kilograms a month. Is this amount of fat in peanuts bad for me? I'm a 29-year-old male, it's 180 centimeters and 89 kilograms. Well, first of all, Tyler, you're hurting me because now I've got to do the metric conversions in my head. Um, so you're about 2.2 times 90 is 100, about 200 pounds and 180 centimeters divided by 2.54, so that's, that's 5, that's 30, that's so. So 30 plus 30, so 35, so 70 inches, so you're about six, so you're about 5'10", and you're about 200 pounds. So that's a little, your BMI is probably a little on the high side, you know, probably somewhere between overweight and obese, unless I've just totally screwed the math. Um, and five pounds of, you know, four and a half pounds of peanut butter a month is a lot of peanut butter. Um, yeah, that seems like a lot of peanut butter. I don't know, I don't have like, I don't have math. I mean, I don't sign. No one's done the randomized controlled trial on how much four and a half pounds of peanut butter and a 200 pound, five foot 10 male, do you? But that seems like something you could eliminate from your diet, then you would do fine if you kept everything else going. However, you should talk to your doctor. I don't think there's any, that's necessarily any, anything unhealthy about the peanuts or probably the fat, but that's just, that is a lot of calories and a lot of fat and a lot of peanut butter. Um, probably more than you need. You guys have the best questions today. I don't know what it is. These are great. I, I think probably, you're pushing me. Yes, I think that's probably more peanut butter than you need. It just is. Midnight SG, as a pediatrician, what are your views on sleep training babies? There's a ton of discussion about the proper agent technique. Any research behind the subject? Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, as a pediatrician, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, there's not a lot of randomized control evidence there. As a parent, I think sleep training is a decent thing. Um, some kids don't need it, they just go right to bed. But I will say that babies are not stupid. Um, and they learn like other animals learn as well. If every time your baby cries, you run in to get them, they will learn that if they cry, you will run in to get them. They will figure this out. We can train birds and rats and all kinds of stuff. Babies can learn too. So. Learning to put yourself to sleep, learning to settle yourself to sleep, those are important skills. Do I think that not sleep training a baby results in an adult that can't fall asleep and needs its mommy and daddy all the time? No, everybody in the end turns out the same. But I often will say when I'm talking to parents that yes, learning to let your baby put itself back to sleep and learning to let them comfort themselves is probably an important skill for the family and for the parent as much as it is for the child. Having said that, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, there are no specific rules. The whole like, you know, ferberizing method where you count the minutes and everything else, that works for some people, not for others. You should do what works for you. Robert Gallagher, what does continuing education look like for healthcare providers? Ho, 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 it's a mess. Um, it's so different, it's all over the place. Yeah. 
it's required. I'm not sure always what the benefit is. There's some good research that shows that most healthcare providers often choose CME and the stuff they're already very good at, which of course doesn't serve the purpose. A lot of the ways that we keep track of it and need it and use it is all over the map. Um, we also don't credit a lot of stuff that should be credited. I spend an enormous amount of time reading the medical literature for which I get no credit whatsoever. Um, but I get credit for like reviewing a paper. I get credit for sitting in a talk that I could sleep through. So I, I don't know. Um, I, I think we could do so much of a better job with CME, continuing medical education, than we do. Um, but basically, for most licensing purposes, people are re required to go through a certain number of hours of it um, every few years, and that's what we do. I'm going to zip through the last few because I want to get so many. Anthrax Records, you should tell us about any health benefits of shaving versus beard. So I'm sure you're noticing I lost my beard. I had a shaving incident a couple nights ago. I got back from a trip to Seattle and I didn't notice that the beard trimmer had shifted from like the five setting to the zero setting while I was in the luggage. And when I went, like just it just came off. And I mean to like the skin, at which point my wife and I held a real consultation period and decided we couldn't pretend it wasn't there. And so my options were to like make it look like symmetrical, which looked terrible, or just take it all off. And then we'll see how things go and take it off. So it's been off for like two nights. I'm still having trouble with it. I'm not even sure Amy's really comfortable with it. We're going to see how it goes. I don't think there are any health benefits, none that I know of. I've seen people who have really dirty beards, and i got to imagine that's not good. But I don't think that's a health issue for the most part. And so I don't know that there's any good studies that, that really have studied shaving versus beard. But you should let me know what you think. I keep hearing I look a little bit younger. That might be a good thing. I don't know. Well, we'll see what goes. Last two questions. Sam Cook. Are daycares considered putting hand sanitizer outside of each classroom for parents to use before coming in? Have those been shown to impact disease transmission and practical applications? Um, I, oh, you know what? Screw the, this lightning round. I'm telling a great story right now. I went to my kids' daycare when I was young. I was there like preschool because, of course, we call it preschool. It makes us feel better about daycare. Um, and I was there, and they were doing um, – they were putting out cookies – they were like somebody's birthday party and everybody got a cookie. And they put the cookies down on the table. And everyone, meaning every parent but me, pretty much started freaking out and having this huge argument and actually lecturing the teacher on like how putting the cookie on the table, that you know there were germs on the table and how dangerous that was and like how there wasn't enough hand sanitizer around the room for the kids to constantly keep washing their hands. And while this argument was going on, I swear to you, a kid I watched right here wiped his nose like this across his face, leaned over and wiped it across another kid's mouth. Just went like, and, what? and I was like, I don't think the cookie on the table is the problem. Kids are like germ factories. And it's like, there's germs out. The kid's snot was everywhere. It's like, Egh. so. I don't think that the parent washing their hands or like hand sanitizing them before they enter the room on the very few instances they're coming is going to be the rate limiting step in preventing childhood transmission to disease from child to child as long as children are children and are wiping their snot on each other. And so, sure, you know, they should wash their hands before they eat. We should teach them all the same stuff. Parents should, should I, be, I guess, that, but it's like, but really the hand sanitizer for the parent to use before coming in probably is going to make a very tiny impact comparatively on how much disease transmission is going on inside the daycare room. Last question. Jason Pettigene, what advances are needed before you consider sequencing a patient's genome to be used for primary care if you don't think it's useful already? I don't think it's useful already. What do we need? We need to be able to identify genes that link to disease. We able to know that to be able to know that finding out makes a difference. We need to know that we have something to do once we find it out. And we need to know that it's not causing harm. And by harm, I also mean just even psychological or like practical social harm. Those things are not true for almost anything we check for these days. Certainly not in a preventive case. There are rare instances when that is not the case. For certain things with breast cancer, we are very clear that you know mutations in the BRCA gene can have significant results. That's why we worked that up. That is something we sometimes will treat people differently and know about it and they can do something about it fine. Um, but there's lots of things we don't even know what it means. And even if we know what it means, we don't have anything we can do about it. And it doesn't even make a difference when we try to do something about it. And when all of that is true, it's just not that useful to get that stuff yet. So I haven't had my gene worked up. I just don't understand the point of it at this point. At this point, that's not true for everybody in every instance. But you're asking about primary care. 
than trying to do a patient's whole genome. That's my answer. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the, <coughs> apologize. Stay tuned for next Healthcare Triage Live. Link below will be soon, there'll be there a link there soon. It's not gonna be next week as most of the team, not me, I'm not going to VidCon. Most of the team is going to VidCon. I'm not going to VidCon. Um, so stay tuned for the next time that we do it. Uh, but we will still have healthcare triage on Mondays. We'll have healthcare triage news this Friday and other things as well. We got lots of great new episodes coming out. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Check us out on Reddit at some link you can find down below. Check us out at Patreon, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Check out healthcare triage, of course. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.